So sometimes we'll uh, use a little burr just to, let's better get a mask for this step. I don't want to get that bone dust in my mouth. Look at that thing drip. So sometimes you can use a, a little burr just to get a, a starting point uh, before you start drilling so the drill doesn't wander. So um, I, do a, I do the ring and arc uh, three times. One is to plan my incision. I'll put the ring and arc, find where I am. Then again, for the, the burr hole, make sure that I'm still right where I want to be, especially with thicker scalps. That'll be more important. This Medtronic device has a nice little sharp tip right there. So I find that migration is less uh, with these. So once you have it in, see, oh, that was really nice. It doesn't really shift. Oh, there we go. I spoke too soon. Uh, what are we at? 60, uh, could, we, could we go to 75,000? So irrigation is good at this point. Also, uh, not right now, because it'll get in my shoe. Sometimes you get really thick skulls. And I'll kind of turn the uh, drill a little bit just to kind of keep the, the tunnel I'm coring out from being too tight. This one looks pretty deep. And that's always a surprise when you start drilling. You're like, why is this taking so long? And you look over, it's like at 50,000 RPMs. And I'll see how it, if we look on the, uh, Stealth, we'll be able to see how deep that skull was, but this does seem a little bit deep. Here it comes. All right. All right. So, looks like we're through. Let's see. I'll, I'll squirt a little bit of something in there just to. Is that actually. That's working. Yeah, great. Sweet. All right, let's see. Great, thanks. All right, so then the stem lock. And when I plan my incisions, I usually use a little medicine cup. The medicine cups are like the perfect size for the uh, stem lock. And I'll usually leave this a little bit loose just to make sure that the, uh, clip and the cap are able to fit later on. It looks like the bone was a little bit tight there. Let's see. Yeah, the screw's not purchasing. Oh, she's got strong bone. Maybe that's why it took so long to drill. All right, we'll leave that. Interesting. All right, so we've got the stem lock there. It's way too loose because that screws barely in, but we'll leave it. I think we'll be fine for today. And let's bring this back to our position. All right, so we're going to go back to, I think I was working at 60 here. Okay. So um, this is a sharp tip stylet that I use uh, right here. And the goal here is to kind of minimize the amount of manipulation I do to the, uh, to the under underlying brain. I think one of the things that we see sometimes is congestion or swelling 
in the subcortical space, and that can be from um, cauterizing the surface veins. Uh, so I'll start here. I'll bovi straight on this, usually for about five to 10 seconds. That usually creates an opening within the dura, a really small one. Uh, and then I'll pass it through a little bit further to make sure that we're through the PIA. One of the kind of pearls I've heard from other people is uh, don't uh, go bluntly into the, through the PIA, sharply open the PIA, because sometimes PIA can be like uh, cellophane. And a blunt tip is not going to just go right through it. You end up pushing the brain two centimeters deep. You pop a vein. You get pneumocephalus. You get a subdural, things like that. So that's why I use this uh, sharp tip stylet that fits perfectly down here. This thing will get you through PF pretty consistently without you directly having to visualize it. So get that in. Go through. We're good there. And then come back out. And then <clears throat> I use this cannula. And this cannula, again, like I said, is designed to stop uh, 20 millimeters above the target. And that's so that you can do the last 20 millimeters uh, with microelectric recording. Uh, in this case, because we're doing this uh, just with direct targeting and CT uh, confirmation, uh, I've advanced this 20 millimeters beyond target so that this will end up at the target. Uh, it's tapered right here, so that allows you to do uh, a multiple, multiple passes, meaning that you can see it's, it's called a tandem cannula. It's shaved off here, so actually we have another cannula in there. You can put two of these side by side, basically. So say you don't like where the first one is, you can pass a second cannula. And with the narrower, narrow, uh, the more narrow tip, uh, you're going to have less chance of a deflection through the small hole in the, in the, in the, uh, in the dura. One advantage of a small hole in the dura is less CSF leak. Uh, so we see very little pneumocephalus uh, in these cases because of that. So now we're through the dura. We go in. Typically, I'll use something like a Penfield 1 on the curette side to kind of push this through. This is kind of where the operation goes into slow motion. Um, the three, the, the four areas that I'm always kind of thinking, like the eggshells are walk, walking on during surgery with DBS, uh, CHIA is my acronym, circuits, hemorrhage, infection, and inaccuracy. So uh, circuitry, that's our hand link, that usually happens kind of after this stage. Uh, bleeding, you know, obviously that's a big one, and that's why this is the part where things really kind of go into slow motion as you make sure you're not kind of just shoving it into the brain. Uh, infection, again, that's e efficacy and surgical handling. And then accuracy, that's what we're going to be seeing shortly uh, so far as where the lead actually ends up. So now that we have the cannula in, we've got our DVS electrode over here. Again, this is part of the uh, how the system works. This is part of the, Lex, the uh, FHC Lexcel kind of combo, which uh, it's called a measuring fixture. And the idea being that from the stage when everything's kind of centered to the center of the frame, it's 190 millimeters. We've already brought this advance is 20 millimeters down. Uh, and then this star drive right here adds additional height. And basically, without having to do any calculations on your uh, OR table, uh, based in a nutshell, what this measuring device means is that I can measure it like this. The electrode is all the way at the tip here. This one's not for human use. I had to cut off the little label that said that. But you can see I've measured the lead all the way to the tip of this device. I'll now disconnect it. And complain about it's how it's already bent, and then pass it down. So you pass it all the way down. It goes to target. One of the keys here, too, is you know making sure you know when to stop, right? If you keep going like this, again, you're going to keep going until you hit the frame and magnum, right? So that, that's not good. So it's, it's always important to kind of think, all right, what's my next step? Why am I doing my next step? Don't loosen this. Don't loosen this. Don't keep passing this uh, indefinitely. So once it's in there, then we grab the clip. And I had that here somewhere. Let's see. We have the little handle here. Oh, yeah, there it is. So we put, uh, raise the cannula. Oftentimes, we'll do a check of the circuits before we disconnect everything. But raise the cannula up. And usually, there won't be too much resistance, but put that clip on. Let's 
Let's see. Lock it in place. Okay. And more or less, that's how it's supposed to work. This one's not closing, but it looks like it's already been disengaged. Take the stylet out. Uh, and uh, usually I'll use, do you have a bayonet or something? Oh yeah, one of those uh, pickups right there. Thanks. Grab that, probably not with a sharp tooth force up, but put this in. And all this, all these things are kind of squirrely, so you kind of want to make sure you, typically what I'll have is residents play with this in a non-sterile version before we go into surgery, so they know kind of how everything fits together. There we go, that's lined up. And then tuck it in place. There we go. So we would get our scan now. We could take that out, drape the patient, bring the OR or the body tome in, get our scan, and you can see here on our uh, frame link that we've got our CT scan. Let's see, what we can do. Let's close this. We can do. Uh, let's do trajectory. Turn off our proton density. So there's there are the electrodes right here. One, two, three, four. The DBS electrodes. Uh, we can turn on the MRI, and we can see where the electrodes are positioned relative to the functional anatomy right there. So there's contact one. There's optic track down here. So verify that. Check both sides, and look at what our error is, so I've already annotated these contacts. So contact one right here, we're 0.2 millimeters off, and we maintain that uh, accuracy all the way up. Uh, so that's on the frame link, and on the uh, new system here, let's turn on our proton density, turn off our uh, T2, and window our, let's see, So you can see here, there are our contacts. Turn this on. Go up. Let's see, yeah, there we go. So you can see there, internal capsule right there. We're within the GPI. There's the uh, electrode. And get our annotations. Look at, say, contact one, for example. Go to our plan. And this tells me, similarly, that contact one is 0.2 millimeters away from where I want it to be. So I document all that. So, um, so that's basically using a combination of intraoperative imaging, CT or O-arm, uh, with uh, high resolution preoperative MRIs uh, to basically perform this operation using uh, surgical accuracy as an endpoint. So at this point, we'd proceed with closing. And the patient would come back two weeks later for their battery. So any questions? All right, thanks. He's both. Oh yeah, yeah. The 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 slices on the OR, I mean, they're very thin slice. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, you, you can get very nice image. So you can see here with the um, when you turn this off, the MRI, you can see those four. This is a uh, this is body tome. Uh, so this is CT, but we get the same kind of imaging uh, with the uh, the OR, and you can window these. So they really they really pop out. So you, you can get the same quality uh, where you can visualize those four contacts. In fact, I saw even with a, this is the 3387, which is, these are four contacts spaced over one centimeter. Even with a 3389, which are spaced over seven and a half, you can really see those contacts uh, pop out. So the only disadvantage is you don't really have good soft tissue uh, imaging. Uh, so um, typically when I use O-arm, uh, I will have a preoperative CT scan in addition so I can really see the ventricles and the sulci and the gyrus. So. Great, thanks. thanks. Um, I guess we're going to do the neural pace on S next. Yeah. <laughs> Get the full mask on. There you go. That's uh, this bone dust, man. Got a. Oh, true. That was the point. I was like, all right, 
this, I'm not going to do this part with that. Great. All right. So uh, we'll go over and do the uh, Neuropace RNS for epilepsy. Um, we've kind of done uh, Anita uh, Bonsali. Dr. Bonsali is our fellow this year, right there. She's done most of the work for me already. Uh, and so um, we're going to kind of just save time by uh, describing it, but uh, a lot of it's already done. Um, so, as I was saying before, the RNS is unique in the functional world in that you don't really know where you're going to place your electrodes uh, other than the hypothesis that you had in your multidisciplinary conference. Um, and so you could be working anywhere in the brain. So the positioning of the patient varies a lot from patient to patient. Um, the type of electrode that you use, the position of the electrode that you use, all has to be thought out beforehand. It's very different from DBS where you kind of, the whole team knows what's going to happen because it happens almost the same way every time. This is not the same. So you really have to be clear in your communication and your planning to make sure that uh, all of this ends up right when you get into the operating room. So um, for this patient, uh, I'm going to demonstrate kind of our most common thing, which is a um, occipital uh, approach for a hippocampal depth electrode. T typically, we're, you know, the most common one is to place a bilateral hippocampal depth electrode uh, combined with the right parietal placement of the RNS itself. Uh, I'm just going to demonstrate one of these uh, depths today. If there's time, if people want to play and kind of put in some more, that's great. Um, because we're not putting in any strips for this, I actually typically use a Lexile frame to do this. Uh, for bilateral occipital depths, I think it is a bit more accurate, but um, we are already having kind of two Lexel frame cases, so I thought I'd demonstrate something a little bit different. If I'm going to go frontally or if I'm a placing a depth almost anywhere else, I will end up using this setup right here. And so, uh, you know, with the patient flow, we're, we use the arrow, uh, and typically I do actually the whole thing through the bore of the arrow. Um, from the initial scan to the actual surgery. I flipped it around 180 degrees after the scan here just to make it a little more room so people could get around. But, but actually, you know, you can do the whole thing right through the board, the scanner, and typically they're prone positioning. Um, and, but for this, we'll, we've used a radiolucent uh, Mayfield that is actually kind of part of the whole table uh, for the arrow. Uh, it's called a trump table. And what's nice about it is that the, the clamp also has a rail to attach the uh, reference arc right here. Um, and so the first thing you do is you position the patient, get the clamp, uh, put on the reference array, do an, a CT scan, and then co-register it to your preoperative MRI scan. And most of your planning should already be done on the MRI scan, and um, the planning for this particular electrode is going to be very similar to the planning for like a visual laser. We're placing a laser catheter uh, down into the hippocampus. For the neuropace in a hippocampus, I typically aim to get one electrode in the amygdala, one, one contact in the hippocampal head, one in the hippocampal body, and one in the hippocampal tail. And so you're trying to basically cover the whole hippocampus medial temporal lobe with your electrode. And we've already done the planning here. There's another uh, version of this software that makes it a little bit easier when you go to the cranial package instead of this package. It's, it's a little bit uh, easier to do the planning, but, but you can see here that we have in our axial plane, coronal plane, sagittal plane. Um, I'm generally aiming almost the same as uh, for the visual A's, but I, I do tend to come uh, a little bit higher in the posterior hippocampus, um, and so sometimes you can end up going through the ventricle. Um, you do have to be very careful if you're going to go through the ventricle that A, you're going to get more CSF leakage, and B, um, 
it is possible that your guide cannula, as you put it in, could deflect off the hippocampus and end up placing the electrode in the ventricle instead of in the hippocampus. So that's one of the reasons why we always use intraoperative CT to check it afterwards and make sure that you got a parenchymal insertion and that it's very accurate. Um, the, the reason I go through that a little additional risk is just that to get a, a posterior electrode in the back of the hippocampus, um, I think you do have to go a little bit higher uh, than perhaps for the visual aids where I think the, the heat spreads a little bit more. Um, so here we have the trajectory already planned, and um, so we'll go ahead and now we'll just align. This is the Vario guide arm. It's made by Brain Lab as well, and um, it's basically a human-driven robotic arm. Uh, it's I would say it's it is stable. It's not quite as stable as the Rosa, uh, but we get we've done. 20 patients with stereo EG looked at, um, you know, uh, about average of eight electrodes per patient and have less than two millimeters of error on stereo EG electrode placement, which I think is inherently a little less accurate than DBS electrode placement because they're, they're a little bit more flimsy. So we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and typically first, before I even make an incision, I'm going to line up my trajectory and then I'll be able to point along the trajectory um, and make a mark in the skin so I know where to make my skin incision. And so we've already done that here beforehand, made the skin incision, and actually put on the, the, the cap. Uh, the Neuropace cap is similar to uh, other companies. They don't have a locking mechanism that you can lock on prior to pulling out your stylet. So you kind of have to hold everything and do it all at once. It's a little bit more tricky, um, but it's still you know, very easy to, to hold it and, and lock it down accurately. So here we'll be um, going to our Vario guide here. And so first thing we do is it's just, I don't know if you guys have used the um, Vertec arm or the Vario guide for biopsies or, or even electrodes, but um, it's, a, it's a little finicky in the beginning lining everything up but you basically want to do a gross uh, lining up. And and then lock it down. And then you have to adjust each uh, articulation after that. Um, I'm going to proceed here. So first Articulation is here. You have to always make sure that your eyes are seeing each other. Uh, generally, we want to go within a 0.1 or 0.2 uh, degree error to be highly accurate. Uh, and then we can go to our next. Then the second degree of motion here, we're actually pretty good in one axis, and we'll just adjust this. Okay, and proceed. And then we do our third axis. Okay, um, and then we'll proceed. We should be able to see all of our axes at once now. You can kind of visually confirm we see our CT scan here. You uh, can try to pull up the MRI instead if you want. But um, so now we have our trajectory lined up, and you want to make sure that your that your burr hole that you made was actually in line with the trajectory. Um, this looks perfect. It's just the way we want it. So next is basically getting your distances. The, the robot, the frame, the Vario guide is very good for lining you up on everything except for your depth. Uh, your depth is something you always want to worry about a lot. And, um, you know, the, uh, the star guide over there that Dr. Ponce was showing is very good because it, you're always marking the same part on the electrode. There's a nice measurement tool. And so getting that depth measurement wrong is 
hard with the microdrive. Uh, when you're using something like this, it's much easier to mess up the calculations on the depth. So you have to be very careful to think about what you're doing. Um, and so first thing we're going to do is measure the distance uh, from right here to target. Uh, let's just confirm. And so that's uh, 197 millimeters. Okay, so I'm going to want to mark 197 millimeters um, minus 10. I generally want to have my cannula stop one centimeter short of the target. So that's 187 millimeters. And so I'm going to mark that on the cannula right here. And then I know I can insert so that the cannula comes to the same place and then lock it down right there. Okay. And then we can uh, remove the inner stylet. And we know that this cannula is 20 centimeters long, okay, from the very top here to the very bottom. If you're putting this into the Lexel frame, um, the, as Dr. Ponce was saying, the, le the top of the Lexel is uh, 190 millimeters to target. So this thing uh, just adds another 10 millimeters to it. So once this is in place, we know that um, we want this, the electrode to go 10 millimeters past the end of it. So we're going to measure 21 centimeters on the electrode itself um, so that we can have this go to target instead of just to the end of the cannula. And so this is actually a slotted cannula. It makes it easier to capture the electrode um, uh, and keep it in one place uh, while you're pulling out the cannula itself. You can imagine if you don't use a slotted cannula in this situation, you're going to have to hold this somehow really still up here while you're taking your cannula out till you can grab it below the end of the cannula. That's incredibly difficult uh, to maintain uh, the right depth while you're doing that. So slotted cannula allows you to kind of pull that out uh, and then grab it much lower, okay? Typically, we use a suction to kind of pull the electrode out of the cannula, um, and then we can grab it with some bipolars. Uh, I don't know. We don't really have suction, so it's going to be a little bit harder to pull the electrode out. You wouldn't normally want to put a knife in here. Let's see, you can also, I'm going to take the stylet out, make it a little bit more flimsy. And I've also put a little, we call it the Pac-Man, that's just basically holding our line. I've marked the electrode at 21 centimeters, and I put my little Pac-Man there so it'll keep the right depth. And... Um, so what you can also do is kind of squeeze it and then push it down a little bit. And then that gives you something to hold on to. And then generally I'm going to have, uh, this is kind of a two-person job. You have somebody uh, holding it while the other person is marking the electrode right at the entry point. Then you have one person holding the electrode into place while you're pulling the slotted cannula out. Okay, and you want to watch that mark that you've made uh, so that you don't have it move in or out at all. And then you can fold it over, just like you do with the uh, Medtronic cap or the Abbott cap. And then there's a locking piece right there. And once that's in, you're pretty, you're pretty safe. Um, after two electrodes are in, usually, I almost always implant two electrodes. Not a whole lot of reason uh, if you have the capability of having two to only put in one. Um, so then go to the flap here. You can see 
that we've done it in the right parietal area. Usually the incision comes just off of midline uh, medially and it tends to match up. First thing I do uh, when I'm positioning the patient is to use the template. Oh, thank you. Um, just to make sure that their head is kind of uh, consistent with the curvature of the, of the device. And I might move it forward or back just to find a spot that kind of fits smoothly with that curvature. So, and then I actually use the template to mark out the skin. So I make a, a skin incision that's not too wide, uh, not too skinny. Um, you know you're going to be coming back for device replacements at some point, so you don't want to have your incision way big where you're going to have to make a big opening again. You kind of, here's where, um, here's where we need to open to do a replacement right here. Uh, so we make it nice kind of hug right around the device. Um, so we make our incision and then hold that open. Dr. Bonsali has already done a great job here. So basically, while we're going to be drilling out doing a craniectomy. I take that same template again and mark, well, it's, it's a, now a sterile template. We do the first skin marking beforehand with a non-sterile template. So once you're in, hardest part of the case is marking the bone in the area that you want to cut out because none of the markings stay on the bone. So if you have an ability to get a sterile pencil, I would highly recommend it. We, we can't. Um, so you mark it around, then we make a little burr hole in the middle of the craniectomy and then use a side cutting bit to cut out the, basically the outline of this tray. Um, and oftentimes you have to do a little bit of kind of extra bone work afterwards. We're, we're taking this tray and sizing it in, making sure it fits right. You don't want it to get wedged into the side of the bone at all because then it won't sit as deep as you want it to and you'll end up having some, uh, some areas that are too high afterwards. Um, and then afterwards you're going to take your tray. This is called a ferrule um, and it comes with all of the tines except one uh, sticking up. So you actually have to bend the tines down on three of them um, in order to implant the device. And they do this so that you can vary the depth that you're implanting this tray to match uh, so that it's uh, flush with the top of the skull once it's implanted. So you might want to put it in, kind of you know, see how this initial one is, and then bend the other ones uh, to a similar distance so that it's nice and flat. Uh, and then once you put this in, um, you can screw it down with four screws. It's easier to screw something down with three than with four because if you're not in a perfect plane, one of these will be above, uh, you know, it's like a chair on an uneven surface. A, a, a stool's much easier to lie flat all the time. So uh, sometimes you have to bend one more or less uh, to, to make it sit as flat as you can. Uh, the, the device does not come with its own bone screws, so I use a tie mesh kit from Medtronic, but whatever cranial plating kit you have, you can just take some screws. That's both for the burr hole cover and for the uh, ferrule to, to lock it in. So once the ferrule is in, um, then typically I will tunnel from one place to the other, make sure that we get our uh, electrode there safe, and um, here's also where you want to think about what you're doing because uh, in general you don't want wires to be crossing the incision. So in, in a real case I'd be kind of trying to open up this area down here um, and uh, maybe we can do that. Don't want to cut myself. But you want to make a nice uh, area down here to bury the electrode afterwards and um, then I'll just use this, the pituitary. They have a straw that you can uh, use to uh, bring the wire through. He's got pretty tough galia. So once we have that, we can grab the straw, bring it back through. and then pass the wire.
And again, here I, I typically would coil any excess around the burr hole cover and then try to have as little wire as necessary in the area of the battery. And then I'd tunnel this underneath, all the way underneath here, so it kind of comes out right here. Because um, this is where it's going to go into the uh, pulse generator. So after that, then we put in the pulse generator itself. There's a little flange that will hold the rounded end of the pulse generator into place in the ferrule. And that's usually pretty secure, just like that. Um, but obviously, you're not truly secure until you lock it down. There is a locking screw. I'm just going to leave it, but you can, you can see here that there is a uh, locking screw and a tab that you can lock it down with. Uh, maybe I'll just take this one. And you have to be careful. This, uh, this tab is very easy to lose and drop on the floor. Um, they will often say to put that on the, on the tray um, so that you don't drop it even before you put the tray in. So we'll screw that into place. It's a torque wrench. You can't over tighten. A um, little bit of extra uh, kind of bone work that we often do. This uh, locking clasp kind of sticks out more than the rest of the ferrule, so you generally have to drill a little bit of a, a U right around here for that. And then off, oftentimes also this part right here where the leads come off um, will sit on top of this bone edge, so oftentimes I'll just feather this bone edge down so that this sits a little bit flatter. Uh, this, this is pretty well aligned, so we don't have to worry about that too much. So we put that underneath, and then we have to place the electrode in now. And typically we're trying to juggle two electrodes at the same time. We'll just have one today. And there's actually a little tan line on the electrode, I don't know if you can see it, that um, you have to have flush with the cover, and then that's how you know it's in all the way. And then we'll lock that down with the torque wrench again. And again, as you're locking it down, you have to be very careful that that line on the electrode hasn't pulled out at all, because there's no way to actually visually line up the, the contacts of the electrode with the contacts of the device. Um, so once it's in place, and you know, again, you want to mark your electrodes with a suture or something to make sure you know which ones are which. You have to know which one is in port one, which one is in port two. Mark it down on paper for your records. They'll also, the uh, NeuroPace folks who are in the operating room with you will put it into the computer. Uh, and then you can take a wand and get live electrocorticography. Uh, you can test the impedances of it. You can actually you know, see what the activity of the hippocampus is. If they're under general anesthesia, oftentimes they might be in birth suppression. But um, with the hippocampus, if, you've, uh, if you're implanting it in somebody with hippocampal epilepsy, you can almost always see spiking activity even under general anesthesia and kind of know that you've gotten it right. Um, and so once you know that, um, then there is a little lead cover as well. Uh, that's this guy here. That kind of just pops in on top, and that, again, helps protect the electrode. Uh, in case there is an incision that goes across the top of that, it helps keep it safe. You want to tuck all of your electrodes underneath the skin if you can. Get it out of the way. I always, um, you know, infection is probably the biggest concern I have with the NeuroPace operation in general, because uh, you're not thinking about just this operation, you're thinking about the next three or four or five to change the batteries. And so um, meticulous closure uh, is really important. So I always wash three times at least for every incision with some antibiotic saline, uh, and then I always make sure that that the galia is really, really coming together on either side of the incision. For a redo, um, oftentimes the galia is kind of cemented down onto the skull, and I'll actually undermine 
on each side of the incision uh, back maybe a centimeter or two so that I can pull that galea together at a, in the deep layer and uh, it's not gonna, if, if it won't quite come together, then the next time you come back, that skin incision is going to be thinner than it was before. So getting that galea together is incredibly important and then close the skin after that. All right. Any questions? You guys will have an opportunity to just kind of play with this afterwards and we'll hang out and show, but uh, thank you very much. All right. You're up. Sorry. It's <laughs> Sense, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's good. All right, so we are going to go over laser ablation. You guys have heard a lot about stereotactic planning, so I'm not going to go into that too much. I spoke about um, the planning for uh, amygdala hippocampectomy uh, during my talk. You heard about uh, electro placement. Similar principle, same idea. With a laser, you're not limited by, um, or you're not trying to place contacts in a certain spot, so you can go as deep as you want, not as deep as you, well, as deep as you want, hopefully you don't want to go too deep, um, but you, you can always pull back or do uh, whatever manipulation you want. But you can see I've planned this trajectory here. You can see an inline trajectory. The hippocampus is included for about a four centimeter trajectory through uh, where I want to place my laser um, as we, if I scroll back and forth uh, through this, uh, you will see that it is, the laser is centered within the hippocampus, and then eventually it leaves. And as I said um, in my talk, um, we, we do recommend trying to avoid the uh, ventricle. And uh, another key principle of planning is that you want to stay out of the sulci. So um, you can see uh, all the major principles I talked about, I just want to emphasize the bolt is a, a, about perpendicular to the skull. I'm missing a sulcus, I'm missing the ventricle, I'm staying on a somewhat uh, lateral to medial trajectory, staying in tissue the whole way through. I have a four centimeter trajectory through the hippocampus and then I extend anteriorly through the amygdala. You guys can try that at home on your own. Uh, so once you do that, we've, we've gone uh, through um, you know, planning here. You get a CT, the way we do it is a CT scan uh, with the frame in place, register the fiducials, extract coordinates, the coordinates are here. Anyone have any questions about that part? Can we go to the actual laser part? All right, good. So I put in the coordinates. Um, the only thing I haven't done uh, is the uh, ring angle, which is 157.8. So I'll go ahead and put that on. Except that the problem is that the CT scan and the MRI are from two different people. Uh, so we're gonna, I'll make some adjustments to <laughs> just pretend like this part didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> And I'll emphasize what Dr. Ponce said also, which is that you constantly have to check your stereotactic coordinates. You have to be very familiar with your frame and the distance from uh, arc center, uh, which on the Lexcel frame is 190 millimeters or 19 centimeters. Um, and that's assuming that you are at your zero mark. And, and if, if you're not, and sometimes you have to be, especially with the visual laser system, and I'll explain why in a moment, um, then you just have to adjust the depth of your laser based on that. So I'm going to put this in. Go to 157.8, 158, fine. All right, so um, dial in your coordinates. Uh, and what I'm going to do at first is there's a... Uh, it's called the stiffening stylet. Is that what you call this? Alignment the alignment rod. Um, I'll mark my skin about where I want to start, which is right there. All right. So now I know where my starting point is going to be. I'm going to get the frame out of the way for a moment. 
So uh, the nice thing about uh, laser ablation is it's a tiny incision. The reason why that's nice um, in, is you guys, everyone's in training, so you don't get to see patients longitudinally as much, especially uh, not epilepsy patients, but cancer patients who are on chemotherapies and other things that need to stop their, sometimes they have to stop chemotherapy or stop other therapies to delay their radiation because of big craniotomy or something else. In this case, I, I have to date never asked someone to stop ongoing therapy for a laser case. We just keep going, right? So there's not wound healing problems. So I'm going to make really a tiny incision. It's a four millimeter incision, basically just a stab incision. All the skin is really thick. You don't really need to see the skull in this case, but you do need to make it big enough so that you can get your uh, titanium bolt in place, all right? So I'm going to put this back up to 158. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make my perforation. Um, when you're making your perforation, depth doesn't matter at this point. Is there a stopping? Yeah. All right, so it doesn't matter uh, on the arc whether you're at 0 or negative 10. And in fact, oftentimes you, you won't be able to be at 0 because you need to be far away enough to get everything in place. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, no, I don't do this very often at all. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, what do you do, Ryder? You can do it in like a park bench as well, uh, but I... This is not fitting. And we're, we're pretending like this is a amygdala hippocampectomy, um, which is fine. Uh, but th these principles apply to any, any laser case, so. All right, so so this is a, a four millimeter um, system there, and then we're going to have a reducer here where we put our drill through. This is a 3.2 millimeter drill, if I'm correct, right, Gina? All right, so I'm going to put my reducer in here so that everything fits. And uh, you know, with the with the system, let me just pull it out a little bit. Just kind of put it down there. So one thing I make a big deal of is so it seems like it's trivial, but it's not. You want to make sure one get onto the skull. You, you do need two people for this as well. Um, Can you hold this? Yeah, just so I can tighten that. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, yeah, just so we don't plunge. So I usually use these. Not everyone uses them, but you don't want to plunge and cause secondary injury. Um, so pay attention to how your drill is positioned. It shouldn't make a huge difference, but don't hold it off at an angle. Make sure you're as perpendicular, as collinear with your trajectory as possible. I'm going to go ahead and drill. So that goes through. Yeah, I felt it go through. Um, we at UCLA, we have, um, we don't have it here, but we have this, uh, I don't even know what it's called, we call it a yellow stick, um, that is an insulated uh, device that we use to perforate the um, dura. What do you call it? You don't have one. Yeah. It's a yellow stick. I'll find out. I'll let you all know. Um, so um, it helps to perforate the dura. It basically, you can put it on there. You buzz the outside with a bovie, um, and the inside is uh, perforated up until the point of the dura. With this, so now we have a hole in the skull. Pretend like we've made a hole in the, in the dura, and we will we'll make it with this. This is the, remind me again what you call it? Alignment rod, thank you. 
Um, so the alignment rod is what defines your trajectory. You can go, you could theoretically go your entire trajectory with this. But what we're using this for is to, to uh, place our bolt, the bolt that's going to, again, define and hold our trajectory in place. Now, here's the issue with this. Um, and it, it's going to be a little bit tough in this case. Um, but this bolt has to fit between uh, your frame and your system here. And so we're going to pull this all the way back. So it's a little bit uncomfortable for those of us who do stereotaxy to just randomly pull these back without any measurements. Um, but that's what, exactly what I'm going to do. Um, because it's, we're not actually going to any depth here. All right, so this has to be able to fit in here. And I still can't fit it in. I might not be able to fit it in in this case. Okay, I'll just pull that out a little bit. All right, so if I take my reducing uh, system here, I'm going to put this it through the other reducer. So you have two reducers now. I'm going to put this rod through. And if you are in your trajectory, it should go right through your burr hole or your twist drill. And I'm going to do what I normally don't do, which is just to puncture it. I'm trying to pop the Dura, and I might have, um, yeah, I'm going to use that. I'm just going to drill through it. Don't do that at home either. And when you're making your initial drill, so don't do this. When, you, when you're actually drilling your hole, you want to be as close as possible. Don't add this extra dimension of, um, maybe I was only through the outer table. Okay. So you always want to reduce your error as much as possible by being as close as you can be to your trajectory. All right, so I'm going to put this in, put that through. But what I'm going to do is, um, well, I'll show you this first. If I put this alignment rod all the way through, I should be able to enter through my twist drill and theoretically go as deep as I want to go into the brain. All right? So that is your stereotactic trajectory. But what we're going to do now is, before doing that, I'm going to put this down here. And that's going to go through your, um, through the titanium bolt. So I'm still going to advance this towards my trajectory so I'm in, my, in the brain, about maybe two or three centimeters into the brain. But the reason why you want to do that is while that's there, that now defines your trajectory, and you're going to apply pressure to the bolt and slowly twist it into the skull. This is a really important point where you don't want to be torquing this one way or another. You want to keep an eye on it and make sure that your alignment rod stays pretty much in the center of that blue spot. Um, and it takes usually five or six half turns is what we say. Um, but then once you're in place, that is gonna, that's what's going to hold your laser fiber and the cooling system in place. To, one of the double checks is as you pull this, the alignment rod out, you want to watch your bolt and see if it deflects. If it deflects when you pull out, you have, your bolt is not in a good position. All right, so do you see that? That does not deflect. That's, a, that's very much aligned with what I want. All right, so now we've got our uh, titanium bolt in place. We're going to change the system here over because you need to be able to break away your, uh, your system once you put the cooling catheter and the laser in place. Do we have the... Yeah. So this is when depth does matter. Thank you, Gina. Do you have the 2.1? That's this right there. So I'm switching to a smaller, uh, I don't know what those are called, uh, guide tube. And the reason why you need that, you'll, you'll understand why I'm changing this in a moment. So that was a four millimeter, that's pretty big. The cooling catheter, the whole system is uh, much smaller. So you want it to be as guided as possible. All right. 
Okay. This you actually need to know where you are. So I am now at minus four. All right, that's about as much as I'm gonna be able to get out of the system because I need to be able to mark this here as well. So if I'm at minus four, that means I'm four centimeters out. Distance to target and uh, distance to center in Alexel is 19. So four plus 19 is 23. So this is going to, that means I want to go to a depth of 23. This is only marked to a depth of 20. So we would have to, uh, I'll just pretend like I'm measuring it out. Uh, I'd have to uh, mark this out to 23 centimeters so I know where to uh, implant to. All right. So I'll put this in. This is going to go in to target. So that's 23 millimeters at the, uh, where it expects it to be, and then I tighten that up. And that's, that's how you install the laser, all right? Or implant the laser. That's not actually the laser. That's the cooling catheter. The laser is this thing. This is, uh, your, the rep will be there, and they'll be guarding this with their life. Um, this sort of goes on the back table. The stiffening rod, let me just take the stiff, let me take, disassemble. So you have to disassemble. I want you guys to see why we have the breakaway, uh, breakaway guides. It's because once you have that in place, I've secured that in place. Usually what we do is we put a stereo strip down here just so we know that the depth to mark the, to, to mark the depth of the cooling catheter. I'm going to disassemble this because you want to break the frame away from the catheter that you've just placed. All right, so if I take that off, break this off, do the same thing down below. And while this, that's the stiffening rod in there? Is that what we call it? Alignment, stiffening stylet. I'm not very good with names, sorry about that. Um, while that's, this cooling catheter is very fragile, so you can't let it dangle by itself. While the stiffening stylet is in there, it's pretty safe, so I can pull this away and you're, you're in good shape. Nothing's dangerous about that. Once I take this stiffening rod out, so imagine that I put a stereo strip in there, hold it in place. Once I take this out, you don't want this to just fall over because it could pull right out. You would then place the laser in place. So there's, right now, there's nothing in there except a cooling system. Oh, you don't want to do that with your real laser. Yeah, thanks. There we go, thank you. Put that in place. And then once you have the laser in place, that adds uh, enough stability that um, you can let it fall a little bit. And that's basically what you have. So you'll have a stereo strip here to know how far your uh, laser is within the system. Um, and you'll have a stereo strip here to know that your cooling catheter is in place. If you ever get confused, the cooling catheter does has basically uh, in and out for cooling, for the saline that goes in and out of the system. Any questions about that part? I'll quickly go through um, what happens when you go to the ablation system. You guys should come closer for this part. So at this point, what we do is different places have different systems. I usually um, I don't use fluoroscopy or anything for this. Uh, if I'm in an area that I'm concerned about, I do use intraoperative CT to make sure I'm in the right spot. So for uh, amygdala hippocampectomy, I would use it. I showed you guys a posterior fossa case. Uh, which I did use CT to make sure I was in the right spot before I wheel down to MRI because we don't have an intraoperative MRI system. All right, so this is the Visual Ace platform. Um, it was designed uh, by a small company before Medtronic uh, acquired it, so it's a bit techy or, or geeky on the surface, uh, but it works very well. Um, basically, what you're interacting with is um, this component right here and I'll, I'll go over what the different things are here, and then this part where uh, you have uh, real-time feedback in terms of what's going on in the ablation. The really key parts are right here um, in terms of safety. So this is your safety corner. Um, the high limits are where you put uh, dots. You can select where you want to put them. Um, and it's small here, but work with me. Is this, I can go to Zoom. How? Right click, okay. So, all right, so you can put safety margins or click where you want to measure the temperature, all right? So I can set target one there, I can set target two here. Usually you want to have a safety margin or a safety measure, 
um, near where your tip is because that's where you're going to boil. That's where you're going to melt your tip. So you want to make sure that it shuts off when you get to 90 degrees. If it gets above 90 degrees, you're getting into danger. All right. The low limits are 50. So you want to set limits next to areas that um, you are concerned you don't want to injure. So for example, you could put a low limit um, near the brainstem if you want to set that. Or you can set it anywhere that you want to be. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But those are really important to put there to know what's in danger, know what you want to protect. Because this will shut it off when it gets too hot. And this will shut it off when, it gets, when those areas that you don't want to heat up get hot as well. So it's a really good way. And I can tell you, I do this a fair amount. And it shuts off sort of unexpectedly. Like I'm not paying attention to the places that I want to be paying attention to. So it's a really important safety feature. All right. So now we're going to, um, so now we've done that. It's, it's a bit of a setup in the, in the uh, magnet. You've got to set up the irrigation. One of the most important things that has to happen is you get the irrigation going. You have to make sure there's a return on the irrigation as you start up the system. There's a bunch of sequences that you get. You can get uh, what we call fiber uh, sequences uh, that uh, will basically get a picture of the, uh, before we turn it on, so, or we can turn it on, it's fine. Um, so we have two perpendicular images here. So one that looks like this that shows uh, one plane. You've got another plane like this, which is going to be more in the axial plane, uh, that gives you visualization. You want to know where your fiber is. If you're doing a tumor, you can give a half dose of gadolinium so you can see the enhancing component so you know exactly what you're trying to ablate. And then, um, so you, this is what it looks like. This is that phase image that I was talking about. This is what measures temperature. This is your baseline phase for your brain. And then what you do is, you, um, usually the rep does it, but you hit set phase reference. And what that means is basically uh, zero everything out, right? Now you're only looking at changes in your phase. And it's already heating up, so now the, the therapy is going. And what you see is it shows you as you turn it on that there's an area of, of signal change right there. See how it's heating up right there? Um, so that heating up is going to show you what's going on, and this shows you the temperatures, although it's not registering. Did I not set it? Or is it just... Okay. Um, but it will show the temperature, it shows the accumulated in the orange um, killed area. Notice that there's some noise. Ignore the noise. You know what you're ablating. Just focus on the area that um, you're interested in the, what is actually going on. Here you can see that the, the laser has actually been pulled back. So the initial area of ablation is out here. And now it's heating up right here. So the laser has been pulled back about one centimeter. And they're going for the second heating phase. I can scan back and forth. I can go between different slices if I want to see what's going on in a different plane and see what my uh, ablated region is right there. I think it's going to cool off. Is there a third pullback? OK. And so now you see another area. I think it's going to be. Usually we wait for it to cool off before you pull back the laser. OK, that's it. Um, you usually wait for the area to cool off before you pull back the laser, assess what you need to do, and then pull back. Before you do an ablation, um, this is your, sort of your control panel right here. This is an important control panel to see. This controls the, the strength of your laser. So it goes anywhere from 0% uh, up to 100%. Um, and that's on a 15 watt uh, laser down there. We do a test dose. We usually turn it up to 30% at first, see that it's heating up a little bit. That never is enough to kill, or rarely is enough to kill. Um, and then you'll increase, and depends on your comfort level, how much you want to increase. Um, I've gone up to 90%. Sometimes if you're dealing with radiation necrosis, you can go up to 50 or 60% of the laser power, and it'll already start killing and be, and be pretty aggressive. So you sort of want to you, you get a feel for what you need to do, how much forgiveness you have, how big your lesion is, how aggressive you can be. Um, that is the fast version of this. Any questions about that? All right. So realize, I mean, we're looking at the, the hippocampus here, but you can do this with any lesion anywhere. But one thing I do want to highlight, look at the shape of this. It's long and thin. That's what you get. If you ever have something that's much wider than that, the company tells you to go up to 18 to 20 millimeters. You can go that high, but it's, I wouldn't rely on it. I would rely on a 15 to 16 millimeter diameter. If you get more, that's good. But, but if, you ever, if you have a larger lesion than that, you should probably plan on having two lasers. All right, good. We'll keep going. Rosa? Thanks. Oh, right. 
Where has it go? Just oh, like just like this. Over your ears. Great. Can I put it down here? Okay. Uh, great. So I'm going to be showing you guys um, stereo EEG placement uh, with the Rosa. Um, so basically, uh, most of the parts of stereo EEG placement, um, it's you, it's um, all the same. No matter if you use the Rosa, if you use Brain Lab, if you use Neuromate, if you use um, even uh, Lexel Frame. Um, so just to start here, we talked a little bit our, about planning our trajectories. Uh, we only have three trajectories planned here, um, but um, once again, we use our T1 with contrast, and then uh, sometimes we'll use a CT scan with contrast as well to see the vessels uh, in our planning, and we'll go along our trajectory. Um, some of the literature you'll read that says really the only vessels you need to worry about are those uh, peel vessels on the surface because those are uh, fixed there and can't get out of the way. Um, you don't have to worry about the deep vessels. I worry about all the vessels. Um, maybe that's because I'm kind of junior in my career, uh, but uh, I worry about all the vessels. So once you've planned your trajectory, um, you try and go uh, straight in and be as perpendicular to the bone as possible. Um, I believe someone else was talking about when you're drilling, uh, if you need that trajectory, you need that trajectory, and it's the only way to get, get in. But if you have options, if you're perpendicular to the bone as you're drilling, uh, you won't have any movement because unlike, say, uh, DBS, when you do a burr hole and there's no bone in contact uh, with your trajectory, this entire trajectory is from your bone drilling. So if there's any uh, movement or any skiving um, along the, the skull, you're, you're going to be off. So uh, when you come straight in, um, you define your trajectory. We have the right amygdala targeted here. Uh, you want to go to either a cross-sectional view or um, a probe's eye view. Start at the outside and then go whoops, all the way along that trajectory. You want to make sure you're not hitting any vessels. Uh, and this can take a while uh, after you've done the planning. Um, you know, once again, this can be uh, typically between 8 and 15. Uh, targets. Uh, you will, uh, when you're uh, targeting the mesial um, temporal structures, you will go into the ventricle. That's expected. Uh, but once again, uh, you want to make sure you're not violating any vessels to prevent any hemorrhage. Uh, once we have our trajectory set, uh, here we have our patient. We can move over here. Uh, we've done, you, there's multiple ways to register. I'll let you drive. Um, there's multiple ways to register. You can register with facial registration. You can register with bone anchors and a CT scan. That has the most document or the um, highest amount of accuracy that's documented. Uh, with the very guide, once again, we do a CT scan in the operating room and we don't move the patient again. And so that uh, gives a high uh, fidelity and accuracy as well. We, you can use a uh, three pin system, such as Mayfield, but I think just for um, stability. And for access, especially if you need to do bi-temporal uh, leads and you're going to go straight in, it's easier if you use a Lexel. You have four points, and you can um, pretty much be out of any trajectory that you would need. So ideally, we're trying to go to always using the Lexel uh, when possible. So we've defined our trajectory. We've done a registration. The registration uh, with any stereotactic procedure is one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, part of any procedure, uh, and um, if you don't do a good registration, if you're not checking to make sure uh, there's good fidelity in between a merge, even if the software is doing it, uh, it doesn't matter uh, the rest of your technique, you're going to be off. So that's the most important part. So we've registered, uh, we've checked everything. Uh, let's go ahead and move into our first trajectory. And we can go ahead and connect this. Okay, we're set here. Where's our attachment? Yep. And so this is, um, once again, Stereo EG and the robots, uh, or at least the robotic arms, are really uh, go hand in hand. Uh, the advantages for this for DBS 
uh, two leads or a single laser ablation, I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's certainly not as compelling, but when you're having to change multiple trajectories, the other thing you're doing, if you're coming in at different trajectories like this, uh, you can't do this with Lexel unless you put it on uh, either sideways or uh, you're having to, to um, um, certainly with a CRW, you can um, maybe have a little bit more freedom, uh, but it can be difficult to get these and the, the robots really uh, allow that to uh, be a lot easier. So um, once we, are, are we in trajectory? Okay, so let's do our axial move here. So we push our button and we can come in. Once again, uh, I believe they're talking about, you wanna be as close to your drilling space as possible or where you're actually gonna drill. And so we've come in here and it's actually a little too close. Okay, great. And then we're locked. This is nice and rigid. Um, depending on what you're gonna do, before you go and start drilling and you've already done your planning before you scrub, uh, sometimes we'll like to check to make sure our trajectories, one, they're not right on top of each other. If you have several, say you're doing a mesial temporal survey and you've got amygdala, hippocampal head, hippocampal body, uh, and then you go and you check your trajectories, all your screws are right on top of each other. And so you want to change that before you actually get in here. So before you scrub and bring whatever mech, whatever uh, platform you're going to bring in to, uh, to drill, uh, it's a better uh, if you can just go ahead and check with either uh, navigation uh, or with a laser to make sure you're not right on top of each other with your trajectories. So uh, we shave the entire head. We do that because the patients are going to have the leads in for a week and, and they have a head wrap on, becomes very uncomfortable. And um, so we think it's actually better for the patients to shave the entire head. Some places don't shave at all. Um, and uh, and that's really it's up to you. So. Let's go ahead and uh, get our drill. Where's our drill? Great. So uh, the drill, this is uh, 2.5 millimeters, the actual drill. And um, I, I like to use this as well, um, the actual stop. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, do we have the key for this? Sorry, I should have. Great. And um, I like to come in and find, you know, we're going to be here and then kind of eyeball uh, and bring our stop down. Once again, some of the software, you can, some people actually will measure the bone on every single trajectory and then measure the drill and put the stop where they don't have to do any fill, it's straight in and, and they know that they're going to stop a few millimeters or a millimeter right inside the bone. Um, so we've done that. Uh, Nader was talking about going straight in. I know that I have done cases where I uh, am focused on the patient and I'm not watching my hand and I'm waiting to feel everything and then I've dropped my hand here and uh, that can heat up because the fit is, uh, is very tight, very snug as it should be and then um, you don't get enough irrigation. You actually can uh, heat this up and fuse the drill to the inside of the attachment. So just pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and you don't want to drop, I, people, well, I uh, have had a tendency to drop my hand and then you're, you're not going straight in. So uh, let's go ahead and drill here. Oh. Can we drill into this head? Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Right. And some people use the drill straight off. Other people will, we will do a, uh, actually use a Steinman pin first. We didn't have one of those up here, but we use a Steinman pin to, to start this. And then, um, or some people just use a little stab incision once they've marked it. And you'll feel a little plunge. And then you're on the inner table now. And if this, and we're through. And then uh, you're out. And this is keeping our trajectory still. Uh, once again, we're going to need to uh, move this back on, is it on? Yep, great. So we can move this back just a little bit. Uh, we get our bolts. These are the bolt here, and there's our screwdriver. Once again, the entire trajectory is set up by our, our drilling and, uh, and the arm. These are the longer bolts. Typically, we don't use these unless the person has a giant um, temporalis muscle. Uh, so this one, once again, when you're 
screwing, uh, using the screwdriver, you want to be straight in. And then this will be snug. That's pretty snug, great. Now we're gonna measure from this point and we'll measure this, and this will tell us what the depth is to target from the top of the cap or the screw. So we're 10.5 uh, or 105 millimeters to target. We'll then take a stylet and measure that Oh, I'm sorry, 73. Sorry, you've got to subtract that. So 73, and then uh, you'll take your stylet and measure to target, and you can move. We've now, the trajectory is now fixed with our bolt. So we can move this out of the way, and you can move this into your home position or your park position or even go to the next trajectory. And then... We've marked our depth here, and we're going to go to target. You're trying to split the fibers of the dura here. You don't want to, especially if you're doing this in children. Children, you can always give a child an epidural and dissect that dura. So you really want to feel and gradually uh, dissect those fibers and pierce the dura. Go down to target. You're giving your tract. And then we've done that. Great. We've measured our lead. And do we have the cap? Great. Some people put the cap on the actual lead. We put the cap on first and add another four millimeters. I like it the way we do it. <laughs> Great, so that's loose. And then we get our lead. Our lead, what was our depth to target? 73. So um, if it's 73, we would ask for a six. Um, are these the proper one? I was measuring these, are these? Okay, anyway, so our spacing, uh, we'd ask for a six, and that, that <clears throat> tells you each one of these contacts is two millimeters, and then um, the spacing is on a six is three, is that correct? It's, six. it's well, it's six, great. So uh, it, what, that will give you, you don't want contacts uh, coming out of the head uh, because when, or in the actual bolt, because it'll, um, your neurologist will tell you about it, that you've messed up their montage. So, once you, we've already marked this, we're to target, you tighten this up just a little bit, you take out your guide wire, and then you tighten it up, and you read off your uh, electrode, uh, so you know what, say, right amygdala, and you read off uh, the actual color, 45 green, that's marked down, so when they set everything up, they know which electrode goes where, um, and then you go to the next uh, trajectory. Um, once again, the, any of the robotic arms, the Rosa, the Neuromate, that just makes this so much uh, quicker, rather than to change everything and, and change your coordinates. Uh, we would then get a CT scan and uh, make sure everything um, or our trajectories are correct. We have not had any real variability um, except for occasionally it, we're either a little too shallow or a little too deep and probably we're tightening this and pushing a little bit. Uh, but that's about it. Patient then goes to the floor uh, and starts monitoring. You guys have any questions? <laughs>